Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on this blessed Sabbath day. And I want to share with you just some things that are happening here at our church. Uh, first of all, I want to announce to you that there is a Pathfinder Club Ministry Day and Social Night. And that's going to take place on May 20th. Uh, that's May 20th. That's Pathfinder Day and then also Social Night. Uh, plan to come and be a part of the Pathfinder uh, Day and all of the festivities that will go with it. And also we want you to know that there's a number of opportunities uh, for you to assist our Pathfinders as they prepare to make their way to Gillette, Wyoming on next year. And so if you would just avail yourself, there are um, car wash opportunities and other fundraising opportunities where we can assist the Pathfinders. And we're just asking that you look out for that and support as you can. And then on May 27th, that's Memorial Day weekend, we are celebrating our veterans and we're remembering the fallen. And so a service is dedicated on that day to remember all of our fallen soldiers, their families, while also honoring our veterans. And we want you to be prepared to join in and celebrate on that uh, weekend. That's May 27. Also want you to know that the women at the well, they are beginning a monthly book study. And that is going to begin June 3rd. Uh, that's every first Sabbath of the month in room three, immediately after our worship service. Uh, the study book for this month or for their first study book will be Forgiving What You Can't Forget by Lisa Turkis. And that ministry is going to be led by one of our well-capable elders, Angela Anderson. And so if you would just please... Uh, join the women at the well for their monthly study book, Forgiving What You, for, forgiving what you Can't Forget by Lisa Turkus, And you want to get that book so that you can be ready for June 3rd so that you can participate with them. Also want you to know that camp meeting, camp meeting is coming up. Uh, we are part of the Southeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And we're a collective of churches within the Florida, the state of Florida, as well as a small portion of Georgia. And we are convening June 15th to June 24th at the Camp Brown in Hawthorne. Uh, the 17th of June will be Pastor Glenn O. Samuels, the president of the West Jamaica Conference. And then the following Sabbath, the 24th, will be Pastor Deblier Snell, uh, the speaker director of Breath of Life and the senior pastor of the Oakwood University Church. And so we want you to keep that in mind so that you can participate and so that you can avail yourself of that. And of course, you can check on the Southeastern Conference's website uh, to get any additional details. All right. I want you to know that in our lobby, we have a table set up, and it's a ministry to provide encouragement to anyone. There are cards there on that table, and the cards are free. You can pick up a card that you desire, fill it out, and then give it to anyone that you desire. You can give it to a church member, you can give it to a friend, you can give it to a neighbor. It's just a way to let people know that you're thinking about them, make them feel loved. Uh, we are living in a society where individuals are feeling overly anxious, worrisome, fearful. Some people feel alone. And that card might be the one thing that just encourages them to continue on. So please take advantage of that. I want you to know that our ushers, our greeters, all of our ministry personnel who are here, uh, we are here to help you. Uh, if you need to, hospitality has provided water bottles and some snacks uh, there in the cafeteria area. You can avail yourselves of that. We're just asking that you not bring those items into this worship space. If you would just, you know, get what you need uh, outside and uh, refresh yourself and then come back into worship. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. Well, tomorrow is our deacon, head deacon's birthday. Deacon Carter, MVP, 
is celebrating a birthday on tomorrow. And where is he? I, I, I don't, okay, here he is on the back. Would you give God praise for our head deacon, our very hardworking, most valuable player? And while we're doing that, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge anyone else who is having a birthday in the month of May. Anyone else who's having a birthday in the month of May? Where are you? Where are you? If, you? if you're having a birthday, just raise your hand. I see you right there. I see the hands. Amen. Would you all say happy birthday to everyone? Amen. Amen. We want to acknowledge your birthday and we praise God for another year of life. We are so excited today because we have with us individuals who are part of the Adventist Robotics League. The Adventist Robotics League. And so we have representatives from Adventist Christian Academy in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Greater Fayetteville Academy in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I, I'm going to ask these individuals just to stand. We want to acknowledge them. They're here for the Adventist uh, Robotics Competition uh, that takes place this weekend at Forest Lake Academy. And they are worshiping with us today. They're going to fellowship with us, and we praise God for their presence. And it's always good to see my good friend, uh, my homeboy from Trinity Temple Academy, uh, Lafayette Trawick. We praise God for you. Uh, God bless you. He is a scientist. He is real, a real deep brother who does good things, and we praise God for all that you do to mentor and give back to our young people. And so thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Are you blessed to be in God's house today? Anybody expecting God to do something supernatural for you today? Would you just give God praise for what he's going to do? Amen. We're excited about what God is going to do, and we're excited because God has provided for us today a dynamic speaker to share the word of the God. And I, I want to just introduce to you our speaker. Our speaker is none other than Roger Hernandez. Uh, we are so grateful for his presence here with us. He is no stranger uh, to this church. In fact, uh, his membership uh, lays here. Uh, he, is, he is one of ours, and we are grateful to God for uh, what he does on a daily basis to build up the kingdom of God. He is the ministerial and evangelism director for the Southern Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, he is joined in ministry uh, with his wife, Kathy, who's here with us. We praise God for you. And uh, they have four adult children. And I wanted to make sure that I was up to date with his bio. And uh, so I asked him, I said, is it still two grandchildren? Well, come to find out, they had another grandchildren on yesterday, a grandchild on yesterday. And so uh, another grandchild on yesterday. We praise God for him. And I believe one is on the way. One is on the way and they're all girls. So we praise God for what God is doing to build up the body of Christ. Uh, Pastor Hernandez is a prolific writer and author of some 30 plus books. Uh, one of the things that I've always appreciated about him is his helpfulness. Uh, whether on social media or when you meet him, he's always willing to provide nuggets. He's always pro willing to provide uh, shared experiences and be transparent uh, for ministry. So we know that he is well capable to be the ministerial leader uh, for our union uh, because he does this on a daily basis. He is a practical preacher who makes the word of God simple but yet understandable. There are deep truths in his messages but he breaks it down so that even the youngest child can understand. And today we are excited about what God is going to do through him through the ministry of the preached word. I praise God for what God does to give us his word. And we look forward and we await what he will do through you, Pastor Roger Hernandez. Are you all ready for worship? You ready to experience God? Would you just give God praise one more time as we go into worship? with a spirit of expectancy. Amen, amen, amen. Happy Sabbath. 
Happy Sabbath, church. You know, I was watching the uh, game yesterday, or the games yesterday, uh, the NBA Finals, and as they were panning the camera around, you could see the crowds going crazy. They are hype over these individual scoring basketballs who have never done anything for them. Not a single thing. They have never given their check away. They, they're getting paid for, for what they do, but these people in the fans paying thousands to go watch them and nonetheless cheer louder than you can ever imagine. Then I think about when we come in here. We can sit, we can look, we can watch. We may want them to do some flips on stage to get us excited or hyped for what's about to happen. But when I think about the fact that when I woke up, I was able to walk on my, my own two feet, that, that I'm able to be here and see through my own eyes. I mean, via glasses, but amen for that. And so I want to know, can we give a moment to give a praise that should rival that of what they do in the stands? Because we can worship a God who has given us more than we've ever deserved. So I'm going to count to three. And on three, I just need you to praise him in a very special way. I know he's blessed you this week. So please praise him for that. One. Two, three. Can we praise God together real quick? Amen. 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 Yes, yes. Listen, guys, there's so much we can be grateful for God for. It's so much. And I don't know what your week was like. It may have been tough. You may have had some real hard battles, but you're here because God. And the Bible says he will never leave nor forsake us. So you are here because of God, and you will go with him. Am I right? Amen, amen. Well, real quick, one thing we love to do is in this house, we love to show love to our neighbors, right? Amen, church family. And we have some guests here. So church family, I'm gonna ask that we stand up. Can we, can we stand up? Amen. And go show love to someone in this house today. Say hello, ask them about their week, give them a hug, maybe a picture. But let's show love as Christ would want us to do.
Amen. Amen. The Bible calls us to specificity as it relates to our prayer life. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. I believe that that is a promise of God that he honors both our perseverance and our willingness to be specific about the thing for which we desire. Because we serve a God who is interested in the things that we are dealing with, I want to invite you to join me at this time as we go into corporate prayer. One of the most important parts of our worship experience is when we come together and collectively acknowledge that we need the Lord. We do this through corporate prayer. And there are many requests, there are many issues, there are many situations that we're facing. And Dr. Doggett is going to talk about uh, some of that. But by your presence here, I know that there are those among us who have some specific needs. Maybe your need is financial. Maybe your need is relational. Maybe there's a broken or severed relationship. Maybe, maybe there is a physical need that God is still in the business of providing healing for his people. Maybe your need is a spiritual one. You're dealing with something that's deep and, and you need God to move in a very mighty and marked way. I believe that God does that for us because he is the God who still works miracles in 2023. And so I'm going to invite you to just pause for a moment as we consider some prayer requests that we want every single person who believes to lift up. And then by your acknowledgement of those prayer requests, I'm going to ask you again to come down at that time as we seek God in prayer. We're pausing right now before prayer to first of all thank God because he is a hear, a God who hears and answers prayer. And sometimes we fail to say thank you. Today we want to say thank you first of all. Uh, we have a, a lady today we're going to pray over, Shira Cooper. I'm going to ask her to come forward. Come on forward, come on forward. Listen, some, sometimes life can be a little hard. And over the years, Ashira, some time ago, came to us and had some needs, had some needs. But we serve a God who responds to our need. The people of God surrounded you, gave a little help, but there's an iron spirit inside of you. And God who overshadows and covers you. She lives in California now. At, at one point, at one point, it was pretty hard to even find shelter here in the Orlando area. But she's now living in California. She's married. And she also graduated with an RN. Just this past week, isn't that right? Come on, put your hands together better than that. We talk about a God who can take you someplace Here's a living witness right here. She's about to go back to California. So one of the things we want to do today, Pastor McLean, is we want to pray a special prayer of anointing over her and her family. That God would continue to lift her because we know the devil doesn't like victory stories like this. And he never sleeps and he doesn't slumber very often. But we know that God is greater than he is. So we're going to pray over you. And then I promised someone, last week I told you about a young man who was shot two times. Tragic situation. You know gun violence is out of control. It's the wild, wild west in this state. I'm not going to get into politics, but our governor thinks it's a good idea to carry guns with no permit, concealed carry, no permit. So we've got some, some tension right now. There are those who are trying to work at slowing down gun violence while it seems like there is a coalition of people who think it's a right to just carry guns and use them almost indiscriminately. Well, young man was shot two times. He's a young man who's been to this church, connected with this church over the years. 
And I had an opportunity to visit him this past week. Last week, we prayed for him. I visited him this week, and he's having some struggles. He's fighting for his life. Two bullets through the back, one lodged in his neck, one right underneath his chin, connected to machines, and literally fighting for his life. Last night was a hard night. But I said to his mother, I go to a church that believes in prayer and knows that there's a God on the other end of that phone line. When we call him up, he's faithful to hear. And he's able to work his way right down into situations where we can't even go and make a difference. Right now, I told her that we're going to call Caden's name out in prayer. By name. Every blood-bought child of God who believes that God is real, I'm going to ask you to join your faith to ours today as we pray. And in the prayer, Pastor McLean, if you would pause and give everybody the opportunity to call the name of Caden and ask God to work a supernatural miracle in his life. We want to see a turnaround this very day. God doesn't have to do it through the, a long process. But he's able to touch, heal, deliver, set free. I cited a scripture over his life this week. And I told his mother, you, you cited over his life too. I will live and not die. Psalm 118 says that God has allowed some punishment to come my way, but he's not delivered me over to death. I'm claiming that promise, and I'm asking you to join your faith to mine today as we call out the name of Caden in prayer. So, Pastor, there's a lot of stuff to pray for today, but we want to remember to pray over this family. And we want to remember to call out Caden's name in prayer too. And we're going to come back and tell you the victory story. Because we don't just ask for favors, we also say thank you. And in fact, Pastor, would you conclude the prayer today with a good thanks to God? It is a sign of our confidence. We know that he can and we believe that he will. Right now, you might have some requests in your life. I'm inviting you to stand to your feet. And if it's urgent, if it's urgent, if it's something you can't handle, make your way down here to the front. It is a symbol that indeed I need the help of Almighty God. You can handle it on your own and just go ahead and do it. Don't even lift it up in prayer. But I believe that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can think, imagine, ask for. God has a greater plan for your life. So I would suggest you bring your issues down right now. Bring it down right now. Don't be too proud. Might be family. Might be health might be money somebody might be drowning under loneliness the weight there's some who are dealing with grief some have uncertainty in their life you still don't know what god's calling is for you 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 know you have some skills talents and abilities but you don't really know how they're supposed to be used in god's big plan God's got the answers. He's got the solution. He can fix whatever is wrong. And by the way, he sometimes fixes some stuff you don't even know was about to go wrong. He's just like that. Pastor, would you please call him up? with all that you've got this morning and it's not form or fashion. Indeed, we're connecting with omniscient God omnipotent God, merciful God, eternal God, who is the Alpha and Omega, who doesn't have to wonder what's going to happen. Gracious God, loving Lord, we come before you today, God, claiming total sufficiency in Jesus Christ. We declare today that there is no other help that we know. We put our full confidence in you, God, and we 
come to you at this particular point because we desperately need you. And so God, we thank you for your willingness to tabernacle with us, that you invite us to come boldly before your throne. And God, before the throne right now are many requests, individuals of very backgrounds who have come to press to the altar to declare and acknowledge that we need you more than ever before. God, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are mighty to save, that there is power in your hands. And so God, we ask even now that you will cover us with your presence. In fact, God, we ask even now for a supernatural outpouring of your spirit in this place. We're praying, God, that you will even now shake the foundations with your presence and that you might do for us an anointing and a blessing and a consecration and a deliverance and salvation today. God, we pray even now that your Holy Spirit will be so impactful that we will never be the same again. And so God, whatever the request is, whatever the issue is, whatever the case is, God, we're asking that you would be the I am that I am. Whatever we stand in need of today, God, will you hear and will you answer? So Spirit of the living God, right now we call on you to fall afresh on us, breathe on us. God, may heaven come down in this place and may the glory of God, the kabod, begin to move every person out of their comfort zone so that chains might be broken, so that lives might be changed. And God, I pray even now that you will do something so special that we will, in fact, be so deeply affected by this worship experience that we can't help but lead somebody else to where we have been watered. God, I pray even now specifically for our Caden. God, I'm praying even now that you will bless Caden. God, he needs you right now because you are the balm in Gilead, because you are the great physician, because you're still the master healer, because there's healing in the palm of your hands, God, would you go by his hospital and his bedside, and would you even now touch his body with divine touch? And we pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will even now lift him from his bed of affliction and cause him, God, to confound the doctors and the nurses and the staff. Give him the best care. We pray, God, that you'll give them wisdom and understanding so that they might provide for their, his needs, but that you would be the chief physician, the master healer in the room, so that heaven can come down and so that his life will be preserved. God, we pray even now in the company of the saints, believing that if any two of you agree on anything in my name, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. And so God, I'm praying right now and I'm asking this congregation with faith to exercise it by calling on the name of Caden. And so at this time, God, we're going to call on his name and we're gonna do it in unison. We're gonna do it recognizing that there is power in your name. We want God, you to move in a mighty and marked way for him. And so we're gonna call his name in one, two, Three. We're going to do that one more time. One, two, three. God, one more time. One, two, three. God, we thank you. God, we bless you. We give you glory for what you're going to do for this young man. Right now, we pray for Ashira and her family. We thank you, God, for blessing her to be able to complete her nursing degree. We thank you, God, for what you have provided for her and for the healing that is taking place right now in her body. So God, I pray that you'll place your hand of protection on her and her family, and that you'll even now give them safe passage back to California, that you'll go before them, God, and that you'll even now 
open up the windows of heaven, pour out so many blessings that they won't even have room enough to receive it. God, we today, we wait with expectancy because this is just the beginning. There are blessings today. There is healing today. There's deliverance today. There's salvation today. So Jesus, Son of the living God, have your way in this place so that lives will be changed and lives will be transformed and so that we leave this place better than we came. And at the end of this experience, God, may our assurance be intact. May our salvation be intact. And may we leave this place with joy in our hearts and praise on our lips because it's in the merciful name of a loving Savior we pray, Jesus the Christ. And everyone said, Amen. The name of Jesus is holy. The name of Jesus is worthy. So when we call on the name Jesus for Caden, know that strongholds are broken. Miracles happen. This should make the people of God excited today.
Your name is holy. Your name is worthy. Your name is Jesus. Your name.
Lift up your voices. Lift up your voices. 
God this morning. We are thankful for Jesus has given my hand, him a hand, not everybody else a hand. Thank you for the praise and worship. Thank you, Pastor Doggett, for the invitation to preach today, the invitation that I made myself. <laughs> this is my home church, and we can only be here twice a year, so I always love to be in the house of the Lord where you can worship freely, right? Church that I grew up in, if I raised my hand, somebody would ask me if I had a question. <laughs> but I'm thankful to God. I'm thankful for um, your ministry and for this church. Let's pray together today. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity of worshiping Jesus. And we say his name with no hesitation and we thank you. In advance for what you are about to do today, where you speak and personalize a message for every person who's watching online and here in the building, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to talk to you today about the power of your words, about the weight of your word. Uh, somebody said, I cannot find the person who said it, but they said that everything rises or falls based on definitions. I think one of the first things that you have to do when you get married is define some terms. You, <laughs> cleanliness means different things to different people. <laughs> Everything rises and falls based on definitions. You have to define what the words that you're saying means. When talk, somebody talks about acceptance, they might mean two different things. Uh, I, I can't talk about your culture, but I, I know in my culture, when some Hispanic tells you, I am on my way, they're actually not on their way. <laughs> when a Hispanic tells you our wedding is going to start at 4 o'clock sharp, they do not start at 4 o'clock sharp. I'm the pastor, and I am not there at 4 o'clock sharp. <laughs> You know who's there at 4 o'clock sharp? Our white friends. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was... Uh, <laughs> when a Mexican tells you, is this spicy? And they say, it's not spicy. It's very spicy. If they say it's a little spicy, it is horrible. And if they say it's very spicy, you're going to die. <laughs> What's wrong? Nothing. You ever ask your wife that? What's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> Everything rises or falls based on definitions. Words 
have weight. So I want to share with you three things from Scripture today about the power of your words. The first principle I want to share with you is that there is power in your words. Proverbs is the Twitter of the Bible. Proverbs says the following. It makes an analogy between words and food. Anybody hungry today? Say amen. Yes. Proverbs 16, 24 says, Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul, and healthy for the body. Proverbs is trying to explain this simple principle. Words are to your ears. Like food is to your stomach. I want to ask you, how are you feeding your loved ones? When's the last time you said, I love you? It's like that one guy never said, I love you. Never said, I love you. Never said, I love you. And she complained. You never said, you love me. I said, man, I told you I love you when we got married. And I'm a one type of word man. Like I said it and I meant it then. I mean it today. What are we saying to our kids? What are we saying to our spouses? What are we saying to our community? What words are we putting out online? Kathy and I, we do some marriage uh, retreats, marriage uh, emphasis seminars, and we follow, we try to teach couples to follow the six for one rule. You know what the six for one rule is? For every negative comment, six praises to your spouse. How would your house change if there was six praises for every one negative comment? How would your kids feel that for every six wrong things you find about them? See, parents suffer from something I call the advice monster. I read this in a book, this term, the advice monster. We're always telling people advice. And if I was you, and I, I remember when I had my kids, there are some people in every church that give unsolicited advice. There's one in every church. There's one in every single board. I don't know who it is in this church, but if you don't know who it is, it's you we're talking about. People that come up to you and tell you all kinds of things. See, when I remember when I had my kids, and I remember when I first got married, and if I was you, I would. Well, you are not me, and you don't have my kids. Six praises for every negative comment. What would happen in churches that for every six emails or texts you send to your pastor about stuff you don't like, <laughs> what would happen? If, 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 let me tell you. Pastors dread opening their inbox on Monday morning. I have never received a positive email on Monday morning. It's always about something. And there's always something with you, isn't there? You find a problem for every solution. <laughs> if, the, if, the, if the soup does not have a hair in it, you put it there. Six praises for every negative comment. There is weight. There is power in your words. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 5, chapter 5 and verse 3 says, Too many words make you a fool. Turn to the person next to you and say, Don't be a fool. Don't worry. Be quiet. This is what happens. We live in a culture where the church is known more for their rebukes that the redemption but this is what happens rebuke without relationship produces rejection you're always telling your kids why you always have that music on why are you always doing that why you never clean your room and it's always it's always advice 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 take your foot up their neck find them catch them something doing something right i am so happy that i'm your parent i am so amazed parents right now want to leave the church at this moment but i'm just speaking truth because i suffer from advice monsters syndrome i will always try hey don't do that and i i have four ch i have four children well my wife and i i did most of the work there though <laughs> four children two adopted and two biological and in every single family, if you have more than one, there is always one. Anybody feel me? There is always one. There is one that you say, what planet is this dude from? Who brought him here? How did they exchange him or her at birth? And I remember 
always giving advice. In my family, the one that drove us to our knees the most was the boy. His name is Jonathan. He lived opposite day every day. <laughs> Make sure you study. Wouldn't study. Don't do that. He would do it. Don't drive fast 106 miles an hour with a ticket. It is like every, it's like opposite day. I should have said drive fast. Maybe she, you had drove slower. And I remember having conversations where it's always one way. Then I realize when they get teenagers, like they start thinking and they put the headphones on and like, why, why is this communication not working? Because it's only one way communication. There, there's this, this phrase that we use in our marriage seminars that, that I want to teach you today. I want you to repeat it to yourself. I want you to repeat it to the person next to you. I want you to, to look to your right or to your left and pick the one you like the least. And I want you to tell that person the following thing. This is not my, it's not, it's, it's not my phrase. I read it in a book, but I, we decided to follow it. And it changed the way my wife and I communicate. And it changed the way we communicate with our kids. And it's this. Repeat after me. Stay, Stay. Curious, curious longer. When somebody tells you a problem and they start telling you a problem, don't go straight and say, oh, okay, okay, well, you need to do it. So you're listening in order to solve that problem. You're not listening to be curious. And, and, and by the way, if you're interested in being evangelistic, this also works with people who don't go to church. Well, if I was you, I wouldn't smoke that much. If I was you, you know what drinking does? You know what happens? People, some Christians don't even say anything. They walk by somebody who's, who's, who's smoking and they go, <laughs> you're being, see, you're being weird now. Jesus calls us to be different. He doesn't call us to be weird. Stay curious longer. Tell the person next to you right now. Pick one. Stay curious longer. So my son was going through one of those phases, and every time, and next time he comes here with us, he's out of town this week. That's why he's not here. We come, don't don't tell him this story. Just just, just smile. It's like, hey, so proud of you. <laughs> he was in high school. He was going through one of those phases, and we're driving home, an hour and a half in the car, and he says, Dad, I want to tell you something. It's like, all right. He said, my, my friend and I, when a 16-year-old says, my friend and I, it never ends good. That, that never, when, when they say, my friend and I, <laughs> we started to start a study group. That, I, I was hoping that, that's where it went. But my, my, my friend and I, we, we, we've decided that when we graduate high school, we're going we're gonna to go around the United States in the back of wagon trains. This is, not, this is not Amtrak, everybody. This is, this is hobo trains. You know what I'm talking about? Like, my son is telling me my goal in life after paying for Christian education and not going on vacations and not drinking drinks with my meal so they can go to Adventist schools. And I, when, you don't have, when you don't have money, you just order water and a lot of lemons. You make your own lemonade at the table. And you put water in the ketchup and in the milk and in the orange juice. Nobody knows the difference. And, I was there all, and she's like, I want to be a glorified hobo. I'm like, see, if I was me, before understanding this concept, I would have said, that's the dumbest idea I have ever heard. And I'm a pastor. I hear dumb ideas every day. <laughs> pastor, we should. You ever heard that? We should. When, when somebody says, Pastor, we should, is is that they want you to do it. <laughs> the, we, the we finishes after that conversation. We decided. So I said, I'm, I'm going to teach you a word. It works. I'm telling you, it works with your spouse. It works with your kids. It works with your loved ones. It works with that crazy co-worker. And that word is interesting. <laughs> Say it with me. Interesting. I've decided, let's practice. I've decided to go in the back of wagon trains. Interesting. <laughs> I decided I'm not going to college. Interesting. <laughs> I decided I'm going to date this dude. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. And he stay curious longer. It's like, 
And then the next phrase to follow that one is, tell me more. <laughs> Interesting. Tell me more. Yeah, we're going to go and then we're going to stop and get out and eat and it's going to be amazing. Interesting. Just tell me more. And we did not end the conversation with a resolution. Listen to me very carefully. We believe that every conversation needs to have a resolution. Sometimes you need God to do what he needs to do in the person's life. He, there's sometimes that people won't commit to something, but you move the ball forward, and eventually it's going to score, score a touchdown. Christians are not very comfortable with having unresolved confirmations, conversations. It's like, yeah, but, 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 but he never accepted Jesus. Yeah, but, but I, I, I gave him some food. He came to the food but, uh, distribution center, and we gave him some food, but, but, and, I, and I gave him a piece of literature, and they never accepted Jesus. Am I doing my job? And you feel guilty because you left stuff unresolved. Before he was my son, he was God's son. And God loves him infinitely more and is working on him through the Holy Spirit every day. And if the Holy Spirit has not done for him what I want him to do, what makes me believe that I have more power than the Holy Spirit? There's weight in your world. Interesting. Tell me more. Two weeks later, he came and said, uh, I was thinking and talking with my friend. And we thought it wasn't a great idea. I was like, if I had prohibited, the shortest line to somebody in a bad decision is for you to prohibit it. You will never do that. All they do is start hiding to do it. It has to be an inside out transformation. I am so thankful for the weight of positive words. After those decisions and negative decisions, my, my son went in the army and he got some discipline and came back ready to work. Moved into Mount Dora. That's where, there's not that many Adventists over there. That's why I moved over there. Because <laughs> here I can't go anywhere without somebody recognizing me. Hey, what, are you, can you pray for me? I'm like, um, I have some preparation age. Can I, can I just put this, put this down first and, <laughs> and then pray for you? And one of the first weekends last year, he came, we came to this church and we prayed for him. And there are some, we, after we went to lunch, and the pastor said, there's a couple of things. He said, like, I want to I I be a handyman. I want to I wanna have my own business. Instead of trying to make somebody else rich, I want to work for myself. And I want to leave generational wealth. But I don't know where to start. And the pastor said, yeah, you, there's a couple of stuff you can do. And from that first opportunity, pastor, that you guys give him, he has never stopped working. He has his own business. Now he's hired somebody else to work for him. This dude is 24. I wish I had that sense at 24. This is not he had what he had at 16, but, but, but the relationship in the same direction, staying curious and understanding he was God's son before he was my son. That, that day, some, some people he never knew who were older than him spoke into his life and tell him some good advice. And now as you look what God has done, I can praise God. Somebody told me, listen, when you have young adult kids, you need more intercession and less intervention. And I'm telling you, that advice worked for me. Why? Because the weight of your words is measured by the person who spoke them. If a random person on the street calls me dumb and stupid, I'm just going to look, well, what's wrong with this guy? And I, but if my wife calls me dumb and stupid, it's going to be hurtful. The weight of the words are dependent on who spoke them. So your kids believe you. So when you speak into their life, I believe you can do it. I trust that God is going to do great things for you. And you speak those words into their life. They are weighty words. When you say you're good for nothing, you never do anything, you're never going to amount to anything. If you go down this path, you have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Don't be surprised if they fulfill your expectations for them. There's weight in your words. Number two. There's consequences in your negative words. They did a study 
in Queen University, and they found out that we have 6,000 thoughts per day. Of those 6,000 thoughts, how many you think are negative? Just throw out a number of the 6,000 thoughts. What percentage are negative? 6,000 thoughts you and I have. Of those 6,000 thoughts, women have 24,000 words. Of those 6,000 thoughts, men have three words. It's 6,000 thoughts. How many of you... <laughs> Men have a vocabulary of 10 words. Where's my food? Are you feeling frisky tonight? It's, it's, it's just a conversation. Pass me the remote. It's just right there. It ends. It ends. So how many words? How many thoughts are negative? Out of 6,000, what percentage? Anybody? Just throw, it, throw out a number. Just stay out a number. 82 percent. We have found the enemy, and the enemy is us. Once again, the Twitter of the Bible tells us, Proverbs 18.21, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. I found this great quote in Messages to Young People. I love this quote so much because it is negativity that is actually the way that the devil knows what you are struggling with. This is what Ellen White says. Satan cannot read our thoughts. Satan cannot. Everybody say cannot. They cannot read our thoughts. But he can see our, our actions and hear our words. And how often do we let him into the secret on how he may obtain the victory over us? Or that we might control our words and actions. He cannot read our thoughts. He can just hear what you say. So we are always being a negative Nancy and a negative nobody and a negative everything. Everything is wrong. It doesn't matter if it's, high, it's too hot. It's too hot in Florida. It's too hot. It's too hot. And then it gets cold. I had a thought. I moved to Florida because I thought it was going to be hot. What's wrong with this cold? I've been freezing. It's cold. What's it never, weather is never good enough for you. If you're single, you want to be with somebody. If you with somebody, you want to be single. If you're working, you want to be at home. When you're at home, it's like, I'm bored. I want to be working. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the problem is not outside of you. The problem is in you. And you reveal it by what you say from the abundance of the heart. Always finding a problem with the church. If the pastor's too old, it's too old. What is this geriatric day here? What's going on? If it's too young, no experience. Why send somebody with no experience? If he moves around too much, he's too Pentecostal. If he doesn't move at all, it's like too boring. If he preach long, what are we? What, this is like a hostage situation. Not a pass. Not, not a church service anymore. What if, if he preaches too short? I didn't get fed. I just I didn't get fed. I didn't get fed. I didn't get fed. I didn't get fed. That word. I don't like that song. I don't like that music. I don't like that. I don't like the screen. I don't like that I had to walk upstairs. I don't like the fact that it doesn't look like a church. I don't like. I don't like. I don't like. I don't like. And you're expressing all the negativity. I don't like my husband. My husband is this. And my husband is that. And my wife is this. And my wife is that. And my boss. And my, and I, with negative, 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 negative. And the devil is hearing all that. Have, let, me, let, let me just make it this clearer. Have you ever been talking about something, let's say a vacation, and you're talking about Cancun, and you're like, I need a vacation, and you talk about Cancun, and then you look at your phone, what do you see in Facebook? What do you see in YouTube? What do you see in your phone? You start seeing Cancun. I'm like, how is this phone reading my, what, what, what? This is weird. I say it and then the algorithm of Facebook pushes to me stuff about vacation, 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 vacation. Let me tell you how this works in the spiritual realm. The devil also has an algorithm. 
So when you speak negativity, 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 you know what the devil does? It pushes to you the algorithm of hell, the algorithm of negativity, the algorithm of sin. That's why people that come to you are just like you. That's why you're surrounded by negative others. That's why you're surrounded by negative situations. Because the devil is pushing to you. This person's already negative. I'm going to push them. That's how the devil's algorithm works. That's why a, pr a preacher said the way you spam the devil is by praising. You spam the devil and especially you praise him when bad stuff has gone on. Because the devil is up there with his demons talking about, I messed him up now. I messed her up now. Look at her. Look at all the stuff that bad. he's going to curse God now. But you start praising God. Anybody want to praise God this morning? Anybody want to praise Jesus this morning? And you start praising God and the devil is, you spam the devil with your praise. It's like, I, I can't understand. I, don't, I, can, I can't, because negativity should fuel negativity. But this is a bad situation that happened and she's praising God. I don't understand. Spam the devil with your praise. Speak truth. Speak love. Speak faith. I know I have a situation, but I trust God to fix it. All this negative stuff. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. That doesn't come from a good place. Let me tell you a couple things. Because some of you are worried sick right now because somebody told you some negative stuff and it put you in bed for a day. You're depressed about what somebody said about you. You read something online. First of all, don't argue with trolls online. They're like pigs. It's like wrestling with a pig. At the end of the day, you both get dirty and the pig likes it. Stop it. Stop arguing with, with, with trolls. And somebody says something online about your character, about yourself. The I, I process is somebody is talking negatively about you. I process this in two ways. As a pastor, that comes with the territory. No matter what decision you make, somebody's going to be mad. So you process it the following way. Number one, is this coming from somebody that I would ask to carry my casket when I die? If it does not come from somebody that I would ask to carry my casket when I die, they're not going to be at my funeral. So I don't care. Number two, nobody who is better at life than you looks back to criticize you. Nobody looks back and says, I'm going to criticize these losers over here. If, somebody, if somebody's achieving something, if somebody's doing something great, if somebody's doing an robotic competition, nobody looks back and says, I'm going to talk about these losers. Only people who are worse than you throw rocks at you. So when you process these two things, you say, I do not receive it. They come with a platter of rotten fish with worms on it, with their negativity, and they hand it to you, and you will receive it. Give it to me. Let me take it in. Let me, let me keep the platter. And you take it home. That platter of rotten fish. You take it home. And you let it sit in your cabinet there. And it stews. And it stinks. And, you, and, and it, it invades the whole house. When somebody tells you something, say, I don't receive it. I am not what you say I am. I am what God says I am. And God says I am his child. I am in need of nothing. I am the head. And I'm not the tail. And I know it doesn't look like that right now. But I trust God to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Myself. I'm not going to receive your negativity in my life. I already have 80% of my thoughts being negative. I don't need yours inviting my mind as well. Satan cannot read your thoughts. The algorithm of Satan is to flood you with negativity. And he only can find that out when you speak it. By the way, let me just finish my second point telling you this. I just want to free somebody today. When you come to church and all you do is find something wrong with the service. When I, my PowerPoint, there's always somebody that says, you know, you missed, uh, uh, you need, uh, I call them grammar Nazis. It's like, you need... You, uh, uh, do you know that, that verb? Uh, my first language is Spanish. I speak two languages. How, how many do you? Yeah. 
And, and we project the negativity. I don't like the fact that they, they just, what's up with all the, the, what, what, what the, what's up with the pants up in the stage? What's going on with, what's going on with, this don't even, this don't even look like a sanctuary. Where are the pews? Are you bringing in the pews at some point? Is this a temporary, and people are, I don't like that music. What, where are the hymns? What, what, what's going on with, I don't, I don't like the, the fact, they preach from, the, why, why don't you preach from upstairs? Why? And they're always trying to find something. And I didn't like that music, and I didn't like that preaching, and I didn't like the fact that service started at this time. And I didn't like, let me tell you something, I just want to free you today. Church is not for you. You don't come here to be blessed. Eliminate from your vocabulary, I'm going to go get my blessing. You come here to be a blessing. You don't come here to be blessed. For example, if, I, if somebody invites me to go out to eat in a house where where the food, I have no idea what they're going to serve. It's kind of sketchy. This ever happened to you? Somebody, might, you're like, I don't know what they're going to serve. Like, I'm vegetarian. I don't know if this is like all cheese all the time. I, I, or the, the opposite is like, I, you know, I'm, I, I eat meat. And they, uh, these people, I don't know what they're going to serve. Are they going to serve like cardboard? What, what, what are they going to do? You, you have no idea. You have no idea. What do you do before you go? What do you, what do, you do before you go? It's a very simple process. What do you do before you go? If you don't sure... When you invite it to go out to eat you, to a person's house, what, this is what you do. You eat at home. You eat at home. I ask my wife, you know, okay, can you fix something like stuff that I like, you know. I'm going to eat well at home. I'm going to eat well at home. I'm going to enjoy my meal. And then I'm going to go with a full stomach to this person's house. And there's a crowd gathered and they're there and everybody's hungry because they haven't eaten ate at home. They don't understand the secret. Well, you already know, right? Uh, they don't understand the secret. So they're hungry and they're hangry. You know anybody who's hangry? Huh? Somebody who becomes a different person when they're hungry. Can I speak to some? With the ha- where were the hungry people in the audience? Like you, you, you're a different person. It's like it's like it's like the devil looks at you and says, "Man, that's evil." Like it's like, hmm. <laughs> and and you, and, and but I, I'm chilling. I'm chilling. I am chilling. I am I'm I'm, I'm around. Like, do you need anything? Can I bring you some more water? Uh, the, oh, you want some chips? And, and, uh, hey. Um, Lady of the house, are there any chips? Uh, people in there are hungry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can I, can, I help, can I help you? Can I warm up something? Can I serve something? Can, can, I, can I set the table? And I, I'm working around, and I'm walking, and everybody's mad because they said 4 o'clock, but it's now 6. I'm not saying this happens to black people. I'm saying Hispanics. I'm saying Hispanics tell you 4. I'm not saying black people because black people are always on time, just like us. Just like us. I'm, like, I'm not saying, it's like, it's a six, it's six, it's six, it's six. And they express their displeasure. And the person who expresses their displeasure very loudly, the loudest, usually Jamaican. Uh, <laughs> usually. I'm not, I didn't say always. I say usually Jamaican. It's like, <laughs> what? What's going on? What's going on? And everybody mad. Everybody, mad. where's the food? I thought there was four o'clock. Well, it's six o'clock right now. Where's the food? It smells good. It smells delicious. But where's the food? And they're mad and they're upset. But I'm chilling. You know why? Because I ate at home. When you come to church, eat at home first. Eat at home first. You get your Jesus at home. You get your praise on at home. You get into the word at home. So when you come to church, you're like, I don't like that. That's, that's words of a starving person. You come to church and you're already full. Your stomach is full with the word. And your stomach is full with Jesus. And your heart is full with the spirit. And you come to church, look at who can I bless? Who can I give them my seat for? Who can I bless here this morning? Who can I help so they can come to my church? Who can I bring home with me? I'm not here to be blessed. I'm here to be a blessing. Church is not about you. It's never been about you. It's never going to be about you. It's about Jesus and love people. So you reveal your lack of connection by the words you speak out of your mind. Then my last point today. So on the incredible, the incredible words of Jesus. Jesus says some incredible things that we do not take at face value. We believe in Jesus. We sometimes don't believe Jesus. A couple of things he said. It is finished. Say that with me. It is finished. He gained our salvation. It is finished. It's followed by a period. Sometimes we eliminate the period and put a comma. 
Jesus, it's finished except for you got to be perfect now. It is finished, but you got to work at it. It is finished, but you have to keep the Sabbath. It is finished, but you have to keep the law. It is finished, but you have to do right. It is finished, but you have to behave. It is finished. Don't dare put a comma where Jesus put a period. It is finished. He said, it is finished. I am not working towards victory. I'm working from victory. For the Christian, perfection is the starting point, not the end goal. I am perfect in Jesus right now. When I accepted him into my heart, there are no levels of perfections. I'm not trying to strive to be perfect at some point forever in the future. I am perfect in Jesus now. And it frees me to obey. Now I am free to obey. Not because of what I can do for him, but because what he has done for me. Not because I am good, but because God is good. It is finished. They did a survey of Adventists, everybody. They did a survey of Adventists, and they asked this question. How many of you believe that diet has a part to play in your salvation? You know what percentage of Adventists responded? 47% said, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm saved by Jesus, and I'm saved by grace, through faith, plus nothing, period. And if you understand that you're saved by grace, through faith, plus nothing, period, Adventism becomes the best religion you could follow. Because it blesses your whole life. Adventism makes you better at life and makes your life better. Advent, Adventists live, live 9 to 11 years longer than the regular population. Adventists. Look at your husband right now and say, you're going to be have 11 years more of me. <laughs> I don't hear the loudness and the amens that you guys, what, what, what? I should hear like an avalanche of amens. It's like, yeah, 11, 11 more years, 47%. We struggle still. After 150 plus years, we struggle with the basic definition of salvation. You can preach all the law you want. Nobody will say anything. You start preaching grace. It's like, hey, hey, make sure you balance that out. Don't forget about the law. Don't forget about obedience. Obedience is a natural byproduct of a converted heart. And the only thing that will convert my heart is not my effort, it's my Savior. When Jesus said, it is finished... Believe him. I don't feel saved. Your feelings have nothing to do with it. I don't feel saved. I don't feel that I can. I don't feel. This is you again with the negativity. I don't feel it can. I don't feel it can happen. I don't feel that I can. I don't feel that I can remember. I don't feel. And you have this transactional relationship with God. Where you do some good stuff and God will bless you. This transactional relationship with God needs to end. I'm not in a transactional relationship. I could never pay him what he has done for me. I am saved by grace through faith plus nothing, period. And now I walk in fullness of life and I am free to obey his commands, not because I am afraid of hell, but because I am in love with Jesus. It is finished. That's what Jesus said about your salvation. The next time the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Matthew 16, 18. This is another incredible saying of Jesus. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, he's talking about himself. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You're part of God's church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against you. This is what I want you to understand. The church is not a gated community. Evil is. You're not a gated community trying to see how many we can keep out. The hell is a gated community. Evil is a gated community. The devil's house is a gated community. We don't put up walls. We build bridges. This is whosoever will can come. Most churches that I go to and I teach in a different church every weekend. I've never been to a church that says we don't like lost people here. Nobody. I've never heard a church say that. At least not to my face. We don't want lost people here. We... We, they want lost people, but 
But the question you have to ask yourself, what level of lostness are you comfortable with, Pat Masiapo? What level of lostness are you comfortable with? What level of lostness? Because we want them semi-saved. I want, I want the semi-saved people to come. I don't want them with the crazy stuff and the crazy tattoos and, and the dreadlocks. I don't want the, the, the crazy lost people. No, no, not, 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 not the gangbangers. No, 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 not the prostitutes. I don't want the lost, lost, lost people. You're talking about lost, lost? No, no, no. No, I, I clutch my purse. I, I, don't, I don't want the lost, lost people. Jesus said that this church is supposed to be in attack mode. We're not afraid of the culture. We're not afraid of the devil. We don't walking around like the devil is an equal to God. The way it was explained to me is like God. This is the way that was explained to me. God is in this corner. It's a major fight, right? It's a ring, right? Some of you guys like the boxing, and, and, and you know, here's a heavyweight fight. On this corner is Jesus. He's a heavyweight, and on this other corner is the devil, who's also a heavyweight. That is not biblically or theologically accurate. The devil is not a heavyweight. God is a pit bull and the devil is a chihuahua. You ever been a chihuahua? I punt you. Stop giving the devil props. Stop assigning the devil stuff you do to yourself. The sound system, the devil trying to get in the sound system. The devil is just chilling at home somewhere down the street. He's not working with your sound system. You did this. The devil trying to trip me up. No, you knew. Well, what do you think was going to happen? I talked to a friend about 20 years ago. He was, gonna, was dating somebody. He said, I, wanna, I want some advice. I realized that when people come to you for advice, they don't want advice. They want affirmation. I'm dating somebody. My fiance. Should I marry her? I was like, you're going to have to give me more information about that. Should I marry her? We say. Like, well, she says she loves me, but, but she, she has sex with her ex-boyfriend, but it's only two times. What are you saying right now? So, back then, 25 plus years ago, I didn't ha did not have this interesting, tell me more. I went straight for the jugular. I, say, I said, listen, if you're in the woods and a bear comes out, do you say, hi, Mr. Bear, can I give you a hug? Grizzly bear in Alaska, you say, what's up? Let me dab you up, bro. He said, I said, when you see your fiance, air quotes, fiance, imagine she's a bear. Run as fast as you can the other way. You feel me? Yes. Want me to pray for you? Yes. Can we pray now? Yes. What you gonna do after you leave here? I'm break up with the bear. <laughs> I wasted a whole prayer in that dude. <laughs> I could have prayed for other people that needed it. What do you think he did? Wait, 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 let's just vote. How many of you think he had followed my advice, my amazing bear advice, and ran the other way and lived ever happily? Raise your hand. See, okay. How many of you think went back? to the bear and married the bear. They had a bear wedding. <laughs> and now two kids and two divorces later. It's the power of words. I want to believe what God says about me. I want to trust that he has his hand on my life. I don't want to lean on my own understanding because my mind is not designed for success. My mind is designed for survival. That's what happened as a result of the fall. My mind is trying to keep the status quo as is. 
And the status quo just won't do because God did not call you to live at the cutting edge of the status quo. But your mind is fighting actively against you. That's why instead of speaking your own words, speak God's words. God has declared about me that I am his son and his daughter. He has said that I am precious in his sight. He's called me a king and a priest. He's called me out of darkness into marvelous light. He has declared that my church, my life, the literal gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So I'm going to take an offensive posture. I'm not going to walk into a room and think to myself, everybody here probably knows more about me. I'm not going to shrink myself so other people can look taller. I'm not going to turn off my light because it's bright in somebody else's eyes. I'm going to live in the appointed blessing that God has spoken over my life. What he said, I am well pleased. This is my son, and I am well pleased. It was about Jesus, and it was about you. So you walk in newness of life, and the devil and all his minions cannot bring me down because I am walking with Jesus. Doesn't say it what. You won't fight the gates of hell. It just says it won't prevail. So today I'm going to ask the band to come up and I want to pray for people who are going through hell right now. I'm not not talking about your ingrown toenail. You stay in your seat. I'm going to talk about people who are going through hell right now. Somebody's son or daughter is struggling right now and you're worried like you came and praised. And you put a smile on your face but you're dying inside. You're going through hell right now. Some of you right now, your marriage is about to fall. You just discovered the text or the messages. You just found out that a person you love is addicted. Somebody's gotten some news that the problem might be more serious than you thought. They said the big C word is cancer. It's a tumor. Last night, my wife found some documentation from 2011 where I had a tumor in my pituitary gland. And after a year of anointing and treatment, doctors and Jesus, they sent me this letter that said, no tumor presence. And I saw it last night and she said, you need to... You need to scan that. You need to, you need to put it there in, in the PowerPoint so people can see that God is powerful and does listen to prayer. But I remember those times when they tell you you have a tumor in your brain. I'm like, who's going to marry my wife? My wife, my wife, just, my wife has said, if you, if you die, I'm never going to remarry again. I know it's a lie, but it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good, y'all. Like, I, I, I went to dark places. Like, your mind goes to dark places. And I had to confess. And I had to say it out loud. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. See, in the world we live in now, it's a lot of God stuff. Like, God can be anything. It's like the Lord. Like the Lord of what? It's God and, and, and the heavenly force. I, I want to pronounce the name of Jesus. I want to say it out loud. I want the devil to understand I am a follower of Jesus. And I trust in Jesus. And I understand the salvation that Jesus has provided for me. And I love Jesus and I worship Jesus. When you've been talking, the pastors here in the room might my, my, my vouch for me on this. When you're talking to somebody who's demon possessed, they cannot say the word Jesus. When you get them to say the word Jesus, it's over. Because it's not your battle against the demon. It's Jesus against the demon. And the demon against you, you're going to lose. But the demon against Jesus, the demon's going to lose. It's not... It's a, it's, it's a chihuahua. I'm telling you, I want to pray for somebody who's going through a really difficult time right now. It's, I, some of you are ready to give up on church. You're ready to give up on God. It's like, what is this? I've been praying. Nothing's happening. I'm single. I can't get, even get the flies to get close to me. I've been praying to God and nothing's ever happening. I, you're going, it's, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a fight on steroids. I want to pray for people who are going through hell right now. If this is you. Get out of your seat. Come here to the altar. I want to worship. I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to bless you. I want you to come up here. Come with your problems and leave with your blessings. And trust what God has said about you. Trust what God has said about you. 
Trust what Jesus himself spoke. That's why you have to pray the Psalms. Pray the Bible. Hear me out. Pray the Bible. Pray the Bible. Remind God what he said over you. Pray the Bible. Remind him about the words that he's inspired. And he said, pray the Psalms. Pray the Bible. You're going, it's a, it's, I mean, it hasn't been a hard week. We always come to church and say, well, it's a hard week. It's not a hard week. It's been a hard year. For some of you, it's been a hard life. And it's hard for you to pro project positivity when your life is full of negativity. It's the way you were raised. For some of you, if drama doesn't happen, you make it happen because you think that's normal. You have normalized dysfunction and toxicity and drama in your life. And I want to ask Jesus to break that up today and for you to realize that he, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If you're going through stuff, I want to ask the whole congregation to stand in solidarity because if, you, if you're just in the congregation, I'm going to ask you to raise, you raise your hand and bless these people as I'm praying. But if this is you, I'm not talking about you lost your keys, that you can't find $5. I'm talking about really struggling with stuff. I want to know that the weight of the words is measured by who said them. I am not talking to you right now. Jesus is. And Jesus is the gates of hell will not prevail against that issue you're having. He said that you are his son and his daughter. That's he said. I'm using his words, not mine. The ways of the, the weight of the word is based on who said it. This is what he said. The question is, do you believe him? And before I pray, I'll, I'll tell you this. Jesus has said, no weapon formed against us will prosper. He said, greater is he he that is in us than he that is in the world. That's what he said, right? He said that he's your shepherd, right? He said that you're his beloved, right? This is what he said. That no matter what situation, what problem, you can trust in him, right? This is what he said. When we don't trust what Jesus has said, what we're doing is we're calling him a liar. I know you said, but that doesn't apply to me. You're reducing Jesus to this little thing you put in your pocket, pocket Jesus, and pray to him once in a while. There's no demon in hell. There's no power on earth that is stronger than your Jesus. Leave this place with the assurance that the same one who started the good work in you is going to finish. As I'm looking at, at my son doing construction, there is a moment in every construction process that you are out of your brain with frustration. It's like, is this ever going to be done? You look at the house, and it's dust everywhere, and it stinks, and it's humid, and it's concrete on the floor, and there's materials over there, and it looks terrible. But you keep working at it day by day, day by day, day by day. And at the end, it's a beautiful house. Right now, it seems like it's construction debris everywhere. You're like, is this ever going to be... Like you cut yourself, not trying to. There's nails. Whatever God started, his construction process, he's going to finish. Do you trust this? Do you know this? It doesn't look that way right now, but he's going to do it. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we trust you. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, because there's nothing we can do to earn the right to be called your sons and daughters. In fact, we are your enemies. And as enemies, you have called us friends. We trust you today. And we remind you of the promises that you've spoken over our lives. This attack would not prosper. We pray over our sons and our daughters. We pray over difficulties. We pray over situations in our marriage. We pray over kids we just had and we don't know how to raise and we find ourselves at a loss with our teenagers and kids that don't want to come to church and making wrong decisions when we pray about a job that might go away or a health situation. We trust your words that the gates of hell will not be able to stand. So we take the initiative and we walk in faith 
not just for this momentary passing fleeting moment we want to take you with us we want to trust what you said and act accordingly in the name of Jesus we pray that over the next seven days something will happen in every single person who came up here small large something will happen that will remind them that they this prayer has been heard something will happen over the next seven days that you say I can't manufacture that that's love that's God that's God right there that's Jesus right there that, that that's what he did and we can come back next week to testify about what you're doing in our lives in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray amen and amen give a high five to the person next to you say God bless you everybody hands together for that word once again. It's now that part in worship in which we all can partake tithe and offering. And one thing that the pastor said that kind of stuck with me throughout this whole sermon is we come to church to be a blessing and not to be blessed. Of course, when we come here, we are blessed by the ministry by the singers, by the worship, by the pastor sermon, but we are also called to bless others. And it's through our tithes and offerings that allow us to be blessings to others. The money that we give and sacrifice allows us to do the worship we do here, but also allows us to touch the lives of those outside of this church. And so when we ask for you to give, we don't ask for you to give in a way that uh, we necessarily benefit from or that we want to just have your money to have it. No, we're seeking this giving so that we can continue the work that's done here. And in doing that, we have multiple ways to give. We have our deacons who will come down the aisle to receive, but we also have ways to give online, as you can see on the screen. But we ask that as you give these gifts, just be reminded that it's not for our sake, but for God's kingdom and for his work to continue. And of course, as the worship continues to go on, I hope you're blessed by this service. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, as we uh, give these gifts unto your work, as we continue to sacrifice so that your, build, your kingdom is continually being built, God, we ask that you bless our hearts and our minds with peace. Lord, it may be our last that we're giving to you in this moment, but God, we know that you've promised to provide all our needs as long as we trust you. And so, God, in this moment, we ask that you accept our gifts and that you continue to be with us going forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our praise how many of you are ready to lift him up how many of you are ready to lift the name of Jesus listen it's a song that says lift him up lift him up until it speaks from eternity for if Say that again. I'll draw. I'll draw. Oh, man, unto me, lift him up. Come on, Patmos, lift him up. song and Patmos can you join us and lift him up amen, amen. Lord you're worthy of the glory and the honor and the praise hey, Lord you're worthy of the glory and the honor everybody say Lord you're worthy of the glory and the honor and the praise Lord you're worthy of the glory and the honor, and the praise, Lord, worthy, the glory, and the honor. Here we go. just lift him up Everybody lift their hands and give him praise. It says lift them up. Oh, everybody clap your hands and give him praise. Sing lift them up. Oh, lift them up. Oh, everybody. Everybody clap your hands and give him praise. Come on, we're going to lift up God's name. Say lift them up. Oh, everybody clap your hands and give him praise. Oh, let's sing hallelujah.
Just like that.